Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Amy Heffernan. And she is trained as a marriage and family therapist and also uh, training to become a sex therapist, certified sex therapist through ASECT. And I'm just so excited to have her on. We're going to be discussing the topic of female orgasm and hopefully give some tips and strategies and just information about uh, helping women achieve orgasmic potential for themselves. This tends to be a somewhat common issue that comes up in the sex therapy space uh, for many of us, and and I thought this would be a great topic to cover. So welcome, Amy, to the show. Hey, welcome. Yeah, <laughs> so glad to have you, and I usually like to give a little bit of background about how you come to be connected with me. We know each other through several venues, I think, but one of them is the Mormon Mental Health Association, and you have a a background in Mormonism yourself. So why don't we start with a little bit of your history? Yeah, I would love to talk a little bit about that. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, and my parents are very uh, open-minded, liberal Mormons. Always growing up, they were faithful Sunstone readers and attendees and I, they just did a really great job talking about nuance and the complicated parts of history with us. I have my mom, she was what they call, she called a typesetter for the manuscript Mormon Enigma. So I remember her being down in our basement and t- like basically the handwritten notes from the author, she would type into our really old IBM computer. And so feminism was always a topic in, in the 90s when the September 6th stuff was going on. My parents were very engaged in that. And so I have, I think, kind of a unique Mormon upbringing, and they also did a great job of really talking about the beautiful parts of Mormon theology and gave me a deep love for the primary songs. And so, um, it's it's been it's been fun to kind of be raised in a different Mormonism than what I hear from a lot of clients. So very neat, very neat. And do you think that that's had an impact on you then, as far as your interests professionally? Yes, I I have a fun story. Uh, My parents were always really sex positive and really open about sex with us kids. And usually uh, around, you know, seven or eight, they would, you know, give us the birds and the bees talk. And my, my dad like retells the story. I'm sure people that have heard it that know me, but um, he, my, my oldest sister, he said, do you have any questions for us about it? You know, and he, he's very, they very much took the approach of sex is super important and it's, it's it's like if you're exchanging souls when you are sexual with someone and so it was never it was never this we, you have to do it shame based the prophet says kind of stuff it was very much like we celebrate sexuality so that that's very much the model of which i was raised in and so my my oldest sister the question that she asked was she asked if like the penis came off and like went up inside the woman, you know, and he was like, Oh wait, like let's explain a little bit deeper. <laughs> and then my second sister was, was just kind of embarrassed by the conversation and was just like, Oh, okay, this is done. Let's be done. And and my dad always says, and then when they got to me, I'm the third girl. So they were probably more experienced with telling of the bird, birds and the bees to the kids. And so he says, do you have any questions, Amy? And I said, Hmm. And I said, how does it feel? <laughs> and he always like just laughs. He's like, here's this little eight year old that's just, I didn't really have questions about all the mechanics of it. I just wanted to know how it feels. And so he just laughs. He's like, the ground was laid for you to be curious about sexuality and to be open about it. And I love, I really do. It's funny. I love talking about it. I love talking about sibling dynamics. And I also love talk, talking about orgasms and sex with people. And I know that sometimes people are less open than me. And so I always ask the awkward questions and things like that, but it's enjoyable to me. I, I, I'm i very passionate about people enjoying sex and having it be something that's uh, healing for them and exciting for them. So that is, that's wonderful. What a great question for an eight-year-old to ask. I love yeah. that. I love that story. 
So let's talk about what types of issues tend to come up in your therapy setting when it comes to female orgasm. So I would say probably the biggest one is that women are just not orgasming or they're not, they're not enjoying it as much as they could be. This comes up, right? Does it, do you hear that a lot in your practice? Yes, this comes up a lot for sure. It's a, I think it's a very common complaint. Either I don't know if I'm having an orgasm. I know I'm not having an orgasm. It takes me too long to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. uh, even I'm not having an orgasm in the right way. So I know that we can maybe talk a little bit about how there's this pressure sometimes to follow what we see in the media a lot that orgasm happens through vaginal penile intercourse at the same time with your partner and this amazing kind of mind-blowing experience, even though most of those situations are depicting people who've only met like about half an hour beforehand. So th Probably. some really confusing <laughs> messages, right, yeah. about, about w how you're supposed to even come to the experience of orgasm. For sure. I would say that probably the biggest thing is how much anxiety that I see with so many women about orgasm. They feel stressed with their body. They feel stressed that they are not doing it as they think everybody else must be having these like mind blowing orgasms. And so I must be doing something wrong. And so there's just so much anxiety. There's a lot of internalized shame about their bodies. So many women are like, what I call body monitoring, where it's almost like they're not in their body for the sexual experience. It's almost like they're outside of their body, just like watching themselves instead of actually like feeling it and being in it. And like so a performance in a sense, right? Like yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to look a certain way or act a certain way. Totally, totally. And I think, you know, I mean, the, the big issue too, is like people are getting educated through pornography. And so they, they think, is this how I'm supposed to be, you know? And and it's it's just this, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about what they think that they should be doing during sex, which if you're going into that mindset with sex, it's going to be super hard for you to just enjoy it. Probably the biggest thing that I see is women just not really enjoying sex. And I think, oh, well, let's get let's dig through some of that anxiety to kind of get to a place of where you can actually be in your body, you know, um, with particularly with Mormons and Christians that I see a lot, there is so much sexual shame with pleasure and desire and being able to weed through some of those internalized feelings to be able to really experience what their bodies can do. Um, I, I have a, a quick story of uh, someone, she's a friend of mine and uh, she came into my house one day and she was, you know, just kind of picking my brain. She said, you know, we're kind of in a sexual slump together as a couple. And she was saying, I just think boy orgasms are just so much better than girl orgasms. I was like, that's so interesting. Tell me more about that. And she's like, she, she just was just like, I don't know. It's just kind of not that exciting after a while. It feels good, but it's, you know, not that great. And I said, oh, honey, like, let's talk. So I talked to her quite a bit about how to make her body do what it does. Women are not having that conversation to say, how are you making this happen? Like we talk and we laugh and maybe people joke about sex or whatever, but really getting into the no, like how, how are you making your body do that? Women don't feel as comfortable doing that. And so I want to read this text exchange that I had with her because it represents something that I like makes me so happy for this work. So I had given her all these tips and just kind of some advice. And we're hopefully going to get to that today talking about it out of nowhere, she just says, you changed my life. And then she has got tons of exclamation points. She says, amazing. I go, this is my favorite text, the toy or the multiples. I said, you have unleashed your beautiful part of yourself. It is a gift from our mother in heaven. And she goes, multiples, three last night, so much more intense than ever before for me. My husband loves you. And I said, it's truly so important that we can figure out how our bodies work. It's no wonder so many women don't like sex. And then I did lots of emojis that show like orgasm that represent orgasm. <laughs> she goes, I, she I love goes, it. She goes, I could have tried for more, but my body was putty. Thank you for teaching me. Honestly, such a gift when things have gotten dull for us. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff that I love to see. Or when people in my office, when we really kind of dig through some of the anxiety and the insecurities that they have around their orgasm, when we can really kind of look at that and then we can kind of help guide how to help them learn their own bodies they come back and they're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't know that my body could do this. And it makes me so happy. Like that's like my favorite part of my job. Right. Yeah. And, and I think 
that's interesting. You talk about how we talk about it. You know, oftentimes a lot of people are like, well, we say great things like it's sacred and special and you're going to have this wonderful time with your spouse. But those are very generic types of messages. They're not, they don't really translate into the how to's, which is lacking quite a bit in, in our conversations, especially I think in religious types of, of atmospheres where we really only talk about it from this sacred space. Totally. And I, I wanted to talk about this pattern that I see with lots of uh, couples that are you know, come from a religious background. Okay. So they're raised to have these really high, what I think beautiful expectations of what sexuality is. Like I am, I for sure love it. It's, it's exciting. You're holding out for that person. You're super excited to be finally able to have sex. Or if you, if you did engage in sex before marriage, you, f- you felt incredible guilt about it. So you're excited to not have like the guilt associated with it. So you have this like, Oh, sex. Okay. And we don't give in the language of when we give sex education in, in church, because we are giving sex education. We're telling people not to do it or to wait until they're married, all that things. Um, when they get when they get married, they get clumsy. It, it's clumsy. Like sex is clumsy. Like you got to figure it out. There's lots of parts and moving things, and things come out the next day, and like all all the things that come with sex, right? That that you don't always get that information before going into sex. Okay, so we don't give people the tools on how to then talk about their sexuality with each other. So raising people that have sexual maturity is just really what I is my main focus. Like when I'm teaching young women's or when I'm talking to people that are, you know, premarital couples, I'm, I'm trying to talk to them about sexual maturity and what that means, how to talk about consent, how to talk about what feels good to you, how to be open and comfortable and vulnerable about talking about what pleasures you not being shy to say if something's working or not working, you know, and sometimes, you know, you don't even know your own pleasure. So after seeing a lot of couples where they've had this expectation, like sex is going to be good and then it's kind of disappointing and then they don't really know how to talk about it. And then sex just gets kind of blah for many, many years. Then that's usually when they end up on my couch where they're not engaged sexually, they're not engaged emotionally. And there's just so much more anxiety around their sex life that they just don't know how to get over that hurdle. You know? So I see, I see that a lot with, with religious with religious backgrounds. Do you agree with that? Do you see that pattern? Oh, for sure. For sure. I think that one of the tragedies I see a lot is what I call the honeymoon disappointment sex, where you have two often inexperienced, or even if they come with experience, they're not experienced about each other so much with all these expectations and all this excitement and it doesn't go as as, mm-hmm. as expected. And then that sets up this really sad trajectory for them. Because we don't teach how to talk about these things. We don't normalize the awkwardness around it. Mm-hmm. We don't teach people to expect that it's not all going to be amazing right at first. That this is a skill, right? It's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah. anything. You know, if you haven't ever done it before how are you supposed to know but but again I think the media shows these amazing things happening with people who don't know each other and and people are just supposed to know like it's a very natural thing and and that's just not always the case so it really sets up what I call meaning ruts which is either there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with you instead of me there's something wrong with the system (laughs) and then we get into these blaming patterns and oftentimes Mormons are very loving and protective and so they don't want to hurt each other's feelings so that continues the non-talking about these things Mm -hmm. and 10 to 15 years down the road they're like you're saying sitting in an office with a professional with a lot of resentment and hurt and pain and rejection and boy it really can spiral you know just sometimes I just I feel heartbroken it is it is heartbreaking Mm -hmm. because if we just did better with sex education, I think that a lot of that could be avoided. Completely. I, I've also noticed that with particularly with women that come from religious backgrounds, because I do see a lot of Christian women also, uh, non, non-Mormon Christian women. I found that either women figured it out at a young age and felt a lot of shame about that, or they just never figured out their body. You know, they never touched their body. They never, they just kind of just said, I'm not supposed to. And so I don't. Right. So I, I've kind of noticed that there's like two camps of women. They're like, Oh yeah, I figured out, I, I figured that out when I was 14 years old. <laughs> and by figuring out, you're talking about masturbation, self touching, 
Yep. Yep. Right. All, all of that. And a lot of research has shown that, that women feel three times more shame about masturbating than men do. And so in, in the context of Mormonism, I know that probably most people that are listening to this have probably read your post about masturbation, right? <laughs> and so I have similar feel, feelings about masturbation that you expressed in that uh, post that you did. I think that, what was that, like two or three years ago? Yeah, probably even more now, but yeah, somewhere on there. I'll link so, to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have another um, kind of ex- case example here. And for the record, everybody that I'm talking about has given me permission to kind of share their stories. Okay. Thank you. Amy, I'm writing you about female orgasms because it's so important to me. At age 14, I had issues with masturbation and my bishop made me feel like I had murdered someone. I was racked with shame and cried myself to sleep a lot. I was released from being the My Maid president because of it in a pretty public way. Um, in my ward and peer group, it was pretty hard. I internalized a lot of that. Then I get married in a week after of only having orgasms. I was like, hang on a second here. I'm not getting my turn. And he was all, I have no idea what you're talking about. He knew nothing about it and just assumed that if it felt good to him, it felt good to me. But since I knew that I was, it was supposed to feel something different, I was like, nah, we got to figure this out. So sex has gotten progressively better in our marriage. And sometimes I just die thinking about if I had never masturbated as a teenager, I would never have known that there was something I was missing. Wow. That's pretty profound. Yeah. I think I like when, when she sent me that, I was like, oh, this, this really kind of shows how information for women is important to have about their bodies when they don't know how their bodies work. It's hard for them to teach their partners how it works. Yeah. I'm always sad about the masturbation rhetoric in our, in our culture, because I feel like that we're missing out on a great opportunity, not only for helping women understand their own potential for pleasure and therefore being more able to kind of clue their spouses into that, which makes for better marital sex, But I think it's also a great tool for when you're really having values such as the law of chastity, where you don't want to have sexual contact with somebody maybe prior to a time when you feel ready to. And so you have this ability to kind of self-soothe in that way that you're not relying on some other person to have to meet that need for you. I I, I think we're just really missing out (laughs) on a lot of really great ways we could incorporate masturbation into our value system. Yeah. I, I mean, I really agree that like the shame that comes along with, with so many women that I talk to when, when they can kind of overcome some of that shame about their body, their sexual confidence increases so much more. And that's super attractive, right? It's super attractive to be able to say like, I'm going to come into this, to this sexual relationship with my partner and I'm going to be completely comfortable with all of me. And I think kind of that shame gets so much in the way of people having connecting sex. What I hear so many, from so many women is that they're having duty sex. They're kind of being like, okay, I've got to check this off the list for him. And I'm like, well, well what about you? Are you enjoying it? Are you having fun with it? And it's just kind of like, eh, I could take it or leave it, you know? And to me, I just think, whoa, 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 you know, like, no, we got it. We got to, we got to figure this out for you. You know, we got to, we got to help you get all of the oxytocin and the serotonin that's released when you get to have orgasms too. So benefits of all the benefits. So in working with clients and talking to friends that kind of maybe have some of this stuff, I think it's really important for, to help people kind of create a sexual mindfulness. Right. And sometimes that's like, how do you figure out your body? How, how can you do that? Cause when you can like learn how to do it for yourself, you can, you can teach someone or you can help make that happen for you in your sexual relationship. Okay. And a lot of women have issues with the word masturbation. And so I like to think of a different word. I'm like, how do we unlock this beautiful part of yourself? How do we explore? How do we have body exploration, you know, in a way that doesn't feel like secretive or weird or and like no anxiety. Like I want you to go into this feeling your whole body and really being present and, and just exploring what works for you. If that's in the shower, when in the bed with your, with, you know, like a vibrator that can help you so many things you can do to kind of help your, help yourself figure this out. 
And I, I, I tell women all the time to get into this like sexual mindfulness. You need to shut all the doors of the voices that you're hearing, whether it's your parents, whether it's like a, a church authority or maybe even your spouse, like just shut off all the doors so that you can actually be present in your body and feel what is going to work for you. And I liked what you said about self-confidence and and it's not that self-confidence is attractive to your partner, which it is, but I think it's, it's uh, sexual confidence makes you feel sexier, makes you feel more in tune with your own sensuality and, and your persona as a sexual being, which again, I don't think we have much practice on, right? So we either have the temptress type of role model for a woman, which mm-hmm. most Mormon women are not going to feel comfortable feeling like a temptress, mm-hmm. or you have the mother role model, which that's wah, wah. even though you need sex to become a mother, nobody seems to think that's a very sexy concept. <laughs> and, so, Definitely and so you can see how it's really hard to even tune into the sensual energy that we have as women without these kind of cultural definitions of what it means to be a successful Mormon woman. Completely, completely. And I'm not even like, I, I want to also acknowledge, like, I'm not just talking about married Mormon women. I'm talking about single women too. You know, it's just like, how do you connect with your body? How do you learn how to have information about what works, what doesn't work, you know? And it's hard because it, it's awkward to talk about that with people sometimes, right? To be able to say, well, how do I get it to work? I don't even know where to start. I, I hear so many women talking about how, oh, maybe the first few years of our marriage, I didn't orgasm, but then I we just learned how to do it. And I always want to ask them, okay, what did you do differently that helped you have an orgasm, right? And consistently what I hear is, oh, I just stopped feeling so anxious about it. The pressure was off. We were having fun. It was enjoyable or, you know, personally by, in, like by yourself, it was just, I was able to get comfortable and feel and feel good in my body, you know? And so I love it. I love hearing that for people to be able to kind of tap into themselves in a way that doesn't feel shame-based. I guess that's the biggest thing. So how do you think people go about that? Cause it's one thing to say, Oh yeah, I just kind of stopped being anxious, but yeah, that can okay. be a really hard thing to know how to do. <laughs> it is. It's it's especially when you have years of anxiety related to if you masturbated, you felt shame every time you did it, or you just don't even you've never done it, and your partner's never been able to help you do it, and you just don't even know anything. So, you know, how do you then just get comfortable, right? So I so talking about this a lot with clients. So first off, I think it's important to kind of just talk about general myths about how orgasms work. Okay. So 50 to 60% of women are thinking the only way we orgasm is in our vagina. I always talk to women like the clitoris is the most common way women are going to orgasm. So don't ignore your clitoris, you know, like you got to start there because the mystery is like maybe when women are having internal orgasms, it, it really is just the internal clitoris that is making that all happen for them. And from like a theology perspective, if we are created in the image of our parents, the heavenly parents, like heavenly mother has a clitoris that is only purpose is to have pleasure. And so to me, I feel like it's a it's a, such a divine part of ourselves to be able to have this on a divine theology level. Sex is an important aspect of this, so we we've got to move past that shame on this for women. Okay, so the clitoris, hello clitoris. Okay, so we <laughs> need to definitely be paying way more attention to that. A lot of times, some women don't even quite know like. It, where is their clitoris? All other women are like, Oh, honey, I know exactly where my clitoris is. So 8,000 nerve endings on that little tiny baby right there. Okay, super good. It's a, actually a way bigger or, organ than people think it is. The only the hood is what we see. Um, it, the hood itself even has two times more nerve endings than a penis. So it's like super sensitive, super great. We need to not ignore it. Okay, if we ignore it, it's like ignoring the penis and sex. It's like saying, let's have sex, but you can't use your penis. And again, I know I'm talking very heteronormative language here, but um, I don't want to ignore like all my wonderful loves of being friends that also get to experience their bodies too. Okay, so I'm, I was using the word penis, but we're going to talk, you know, more open. <laughs> sure. Anyways, so um, 
Well, and even just, when you said single women, you know, I love that you mentioned that because it's not like we become sexual beings when we get married, right? <laughs> this no, is a lifelong process. Completely 100. And like, again, that's where I'm, I'm talking about this, like sexual maturity, individual sexual maturity to say, I'm comfortable with my body. I don't feel shame. I know the parts. I know all the things. And I want to be able to experience this because it is part of my divine makeup to be this way. This is a gift that we get to be able to have this. Um, so I, I always talk, okay, so, you know, vibrators is a really wonderful introductory way to, to learn how to orgasm. Part of the reason why I was so nervous about this podcast is like, I know I'm going to be offending so many people with all the things that I'm saying here and I could I'll keep this in private and only talk about it with my friends. But I was saying, I don't want to, I don't want to continue that pattern. It needs to be talked about. So why not talk about it? Yeah. Okay. And I, and I really, I just to address that for a minute, I, you know, I, I hope that's not the case. That's not definitely our intention ever, but my goal with these podcasts is really to be informative and, and at a deeper level, you know, cause I think, um, if you're going to have an NPR podcast type of interview, it's going to be informative at a general superficial level. And the reason why I feel this is paid content is because we're really digging deeper. We, you know, we want examples, we want information that's going to be applicable and useful, not just abstract. Right. And so please feel free to share and to be very direct. And those of you who are listening, feel free to say, you know what, that might work for somebody else that doesn't necessarily work for me. Or maybe I'd be open to that. Or maybe that makes me feel uncomfortable. But guess what? New information often makes us feel uncomfortable. And so even as you're listening, if you're having some type of response, that it's okay to be where we're at. This is just information and it may or may not be useful for your particular situation. Exactly. And like when I'm with clients one-on-one -on -one or when I'm with friends, I know their background. I know where they're at and where they're coming from. So, but I'm just talking to the masses here. So I'm sorry if I offend you. This is just my feelings on the topic, you know, right. and, and that's okay. I'm okay. If people are offended. If you want to talk to me privately, if I share this podcast and people in my ward or somebody listens to this is deeply offended by it, please come talk to me and we can have a deeper conversation, but I will be very direct because I really, really am. I love when women can explore this and can appreciate their bodies this way. So vibrators, there are sometimes it's overwhelming. If you've never used a vibrator, it feels scary and you feel uncomfortable and it feels like this is, is this unholy somehow, or is this diminishing my sexuality? But there's nothing else that can go 365 reps a minute <laughs> besides a vibrator. And, and our, our clitorises are completely aroused by that kind of stimulus. So a lot of times women who may not know how to orgasm or maybe do know how to orgasm, but they want to just explore their orgasms to a more fuller level. Vibrators are such a wonderful way to, to learn how to do that. Okay, I have talked to so many women, so many women, and many of them say that vibrators are what help them learn how to orgasm. And so I'm a big fan. There's a lot of non overly pornographic websites that you can get access to to be able to find vibrators that are really great introductions into the vibrator world. A lot of people say um, a plug in vibrator, one that you can actually plug into the wall tends to be a little bit better than battery operated ones, but now they are just making the technology with vibrators is increasing so much. The, the Cadillac of vibrator brands is called the Lilo. It's L E L O.com. It's a pretty non pornographic website. It doesn't have like over um, sidebars with lots of pictures. It's pretty clean in the content that you're going to see with when they show you examples of the vibrators. So that's a great way. So I tell a lot of women, get yourself a really good vibrator, just shut the door, do it when no one's home and just kind of see how it feels. Just start like putting it, you know, like on your boobs or on the side of your vagina or on your vulva, like just see how it feels. And a, a lot of times that alone can make women's eyes open about what, what their bodies can do, what their, uh, and particularly what their clitoris can do. So that's a big one. Do you have anything to say about vibrators, Natasha? Uh, I would just say that there's different types. I mean, obviously there's vibrators where really it's just more like a small bullet or um, there's, there's also maybe ones we would call dildos, which have more the penile attachment 
most people, especially if you're a little, you know, if you've never tried something before, tend to be more comfortable just going with the vibrator only at first, and then sometimes incorporate other types. So there's there's different types. One thing I would say is that all of this, all of this in the realm of encouraging our sexual pleasure is definitely something that can be framed in the concept of a healthy marriage. So, you know, when men feel, oh, am I being replaced by the vibrator? <laughs> or is she going to find more pleasure from the vibrator than me? Or um, this competition type thing, I, I just really encourage people to say, is this something that can benefit our pleasure style as a couple? And even if that means some individual work, the overall goal is that we're working towards having more pleasurable experiences together. So it definitely fits very nicely into that overall concept. 100%. And I, and I tell women all the time for you to be able to figure out how this works for you. And then for you to be able to communicate that with your partner is going to bless your sexual relationship together. 100%. And so I, I, and most men want their women and want their wives to be able to feel pleasure. Like whenever I have couples in and they're kind of talking about how their sex life has gotten dull and, you know, it's, it's not exciting. And if I, if we kind of start talking about how the woman orgasms and things like that, most of the men that I have sat with are like, I would, I want her to enjoy it. I want her to be a part of this. I want her to be engaged in this way. It turns them on to be able to see you, enjoying it like this you know and of course I'm not like oh, it's all about men enjoying sex but it's together this I, and, and this is really my worldview when it comes to marital marital sex about this stuff is like this is your sacred space together there's no other place that you have with your partner that is just the two of you I have three little boys it's like passing ships in the night sometimes with my husband and I right now which is th three little kids you're climbing on me there's you know family friendships there's all these people but the only time that me and my husband get this sacred space that's just ours no one else is a part of this is with our sexuality and when people feel connected that way it, it just it bleeds into all aspects of their life so it's so important to feel feel um this connection with each other so I do think when women can like learn how to do this for themselves and help translate in the relationship, how to make this work there. It just benefits their whole sex life. I've seen it so many times. So, yeah, yes. I, I totally agree with that. I think there's a lot of pressure that men feel about having their wives orgasm. And again, most Mormons that I work with, these are loving men and want their wives to enjoy. And so there's almost a sense of, Oh, what am I doing wrong? Or there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. When, again, it's kind of this idea that you're not supposed to exactly know how to do all of this, yeah. you know, that it's it's okay for your wife to show you and to be tuned into herself and to guide your hand or to tell you things that feel good. Yeah. Not every woman is the same. So what might work with one isn't going to work with another. And so it's really about tuning into your, your partnership in that regard. Oh. And like being able to feel comfortable saying this feels good or that doesn't feel good. And when I talked about that fumbly, clumsy first honeymoon, you know, what, what do you call it? Like honeymoon disappointment sex or something? Right, right. If that's the foundation of which you've been having sex over and over again, it's really hard to, to kind of go back and say, we've got to do this over again. But I, I'm so proud of the couples that I've seen be brave around this. It takes a lot of bravery to say, we've really got to like, we've got stuff to learn and we're in our forties and we have stuff to learn about how to do this. Women are generally afraid to talk about technique. So I always say orgasms are like ice cream. There's lots of different flavors. Okay. So that everybody here is like multiple orgasms, like squirting, like what are, what are the other, you know, the G spot, G spot. So I, I was kind of, I put a kind of a call out to Facebook on just kind of like everybody I'm doing a podcast on orgasms. I would love to kind of get your stories or hear your input about this. And so I got like flooded with my friends, Facebook friend messages. And I thank you all for sharing those. And they, it's so, it's so fun to kind of hear what, what people are experiencing with this kind of stuff. So Kristen Hodson, who's been on your podcast before, and you know, she's done, talked a lot about all the, these kind of things. I love her. She's one of my dear friends. We, we, I love her tons. And so she's a super attractive person just all over the place. But I was talking to her about multiple orgasms and then she was the one that was like you should probably talk about this on Natasha's podcast 
I'm going to give some specific techniques on how to help yourself have an or- a multiple orgasm with, with the kind of disclaimer that like, sometimes this might not work for all women, but sometimes it, sometimes it does. And I've learned and I've been able to kind of teach many women how to do this. And so I'm going to just talk about it. So here I go. <laughs> Let's uh, do it. All right. A lot of women, when I ask them, can you orgasm? They say, yeah, like everything's working. And, and if I say multiple orgasms, they're kind of like, I don't know about that, you know? And so, but then some women totally have it figured out and can every single time that they have sex, they're having multiple orgasms. So the first way to t- kind of just teach someone, here's how you can try to have a multiple orgasm. So first, again, the vibrator can really help you be able to learn how to do this first. And then, and then be, once you get the rhythm of your body to figure out how to do it, then of course you can like translate that into your sexual relationship with whoever you're with. Okay. So first off, you need to be very comfortable in your space, get your body relaxed. I always say anxiety will kill an orgasm every single time for men and women. Anxiety does not help when you're really trying to get into that sexual mindfulness space. You just got to get cozy. You got to get comfortable. You got to make sure that you're temperature's right. You got a pillow if you need one, like all the things need to be right. And then just start, you know, with a vibrator, putting it on your vulva, putting it where you starts to feel good. And then orgasm, like how you would normally if you can orgasm with a vibrator. And a lot of times once women have the first orgasm, then they just stop and think they're done. But with multiple orgasms, what happens is, is your, your clitoris is super sensitive after you have an orgasm. It's kind of like, ah, don't touch it. Like, you know, be, uh, steer clear because it's too sensitive and it's going to like, it's, it's too much to have any sort of pressure or touching on that area. So I tell women, so just put the vibrator to the side of your body or a lot of times some techniques have been where you, you just cup cup your vagina with your hand kind of like giving it a hug a little hug with your hand and and just kind of like let your body cool down a little bit but not so much that you can't re-engage so once you let us kind of settle down a little bit and then reintroduce the vibrator back on and then what happens is is like the orgasms start building on themselves and so you can have one the first one and then take the vibrator off and or like just stop any sort of like touching or penetration or anything like that and then put the vibrator back on once you kind of like get your breath again you can keep doing that up to like as many times as you want like get on the orgasm train and see where it takes you and so that like that kind of specific technique of of taking it off giving yourself a little time to breathe but then re-engaging it um what happens and this is why i think women or women's orgasms are so interesting because men's orgasms you know it like builds goes up orgasms and then they go down but it takes women um, longer time to like get to the like restoring stage of post orgasm. So you gotta, you gotta stay in the zone, stay in the zone where you're feeling it. Okay. And then, and then that way it just kind of builds and builds and builds on itself and it's super fun. And then you will send me text messages like, thank you. (laughs) My husband loves you. And how that can translate is, is into your sex. So, okay. So try it out with the vibrator, see if that works, see if you can get that working for you. And then, and then either do that, you, even you can use the vibrator with your partner there. It doesn't have to be alone. It can be alone, but I've noticed for a lot of women, if they're not really comfortable with orgasms and feel, being in their body, they have a hard time having somebody watch them orgasm. That's a, that's a whole other level of vulnerability is to, it, to allow somebody to be witness to our pleasure. Yes. Yes. And so that's why sometimes I suggest trying it by yourself first and then having your partner be there. Some people are 100% comfortable with having their partner be there. And I'm like, go for it then. You know, if you want him to, to be using the vibrator to help that make that happen, or if he's doing his fingers or, or she's doing her fingers either way to just be really conscious of, of communicating when it's feeling good for you. Okay. So that's the multiple orgasm technique. That's great. I okay. love that. Okay. Um, let's back up. Okay. So I can imagine some women saying multiple orgasms. I, I can't even get myself to have one. So let's let's maybe back up a little bit in the sense of how how do we help a woman who feels like she's never been able to have an orgasm, even explore her body to, okay. to that point? What can she expect? What sensations maybe are there that okay. that we can describe? Okay, so definitely your whole vulva area, vagina area, it fills with blood, right? You're going to feel flush. It's going to it's going to start 
to to fill with blood, just like as a penis does when it gets hard. This is um, if, if you're having some level of arousal. Level, yes, exactly. Get aroused. So it might be difficult, maybe just even from that perspective, as far as how do I allow myself to get aroused? This process of arousal. So you're taking me way back. Here I am talking about <laughs> little orgasms, and you're like, step one. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, because this is, you know, going back to all the messages we talked about at the beginning, this is oftentimes the messaging that I see that can be very harmful within Mormonism is the sense that women are taught to be gatekeepers of men's sensuality. Mm -hmm. And if you're not tuned into arousal, your own arousal, you've never been taught that you're, you are actually a creature of arousal then it can be so other centric that it's very hard to tune into your own yes. body and your own sensations. And even when that stuff starts prop- cropping up, it can be so foreign that it can be scary or mm-hmm. like you're saying that anxiety comes up. Yeah, the shame just comes up. Like I'm not, I shouldn't be able to feel this. Yeah. Or yeah. what is this about? Or I want to be focused on his pleasure, not my own. Like even when you're talking about a self-pleasuring, in front of each other, boy, that takes a lot of vulnerability because it's about me versus I think a lot of times Mormon women are very comfortable with sexuality being about him. Oh, it's so deep and so deep and sad. It's true. And so helping women being able to kind of turn down that shame voice, right? Because what happens is, is that need to help people gets louder than your your own voice to to experience pleasure right is that what kind of what you're what you're kind of saying is i need to take care of someone else i can't be the receiver yeah there's that and then there's um i mean i talked with gina ogden about some of this so we don't necessarily need to repeat mm-hmm. some of this kind of shame stuff but I'm, I'm maybe i'm talking more about physiologically so mm-hmm. how do we start noticing that you know, my vulva lips might be a little bit more engorged or I'm lubricated or, and what, what, how do I even start thinking about how do I elicit that physical reaction? So mm-hmm. what, what does turn me on? How do I start even asking those questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What feels sexy to me? What do I want to feel good having someone do to me? What turns me on? Like what, what gets me excited to to be sexual? What thoughts, what kind of fantasies would I have? You know, just allowing yourself to feel all of those things. Right. Yeah. And it can be very vanilla, you know, in the sense of, well, what turns me on is thinking about my my husband, you know, looking at me with sparkly eyes or holding my hand or giving me a back rub. It doesn't have to be super sexual, you know, like you'd think, mm-hmm. oh, Mm-hmm. What turns me on is thinking about two strangers having sex or something. Yeah. I mean, that can turn you on too. But I'm just saying it doesn't have to be that. It can be yeah. something that's that you're very comfortable with and yet just allowing your body to respond. Do I get butterflies in my tummy? Do I get kind of tightness in my genitals? Does my heart rate fluctuate? Do I feel mm-hmm. flushed? You know, how do I start tuning into these clues mm-hmm. that my body might be giving me. Yes. And that's all the the sexual mindfulness that I'm talking about too, right? Like getting comfortable, being in your space, being comfortable with all your lady parts, being comfortable with your breasts, being, you know, being stimulated. It does take conscious thought to make that okay inside yourself. I love how you talk about the sexual mindfulness and, and maybe a good place to start is in a hot tub or not hot tub, but like a bathtub, you know, like with warm water and all you do is just stroke your labia. You don't even need to get to your clitoris, no. you know, like the first time or, yeah. or you might do a mirror exercise, right? Where you actually look at yourself and kind of just deal with whatever shows up yep. as yep. you look at yourself, which may not all be positive. Right. Yep. And so, yeah. These are just maybe small things, you know, that can start helping you get to that place of, huh, I'm, I'm curious about myself. I'm interested in what shows up, yep. what's possibly positive, what's possibly negative. Does that resonate with First you? Thing, a lot of women are uncomfortable touching themselves sometimes, right? There's sort of what I call vagina shame. Right. 
it's like they're afraid to just like actually touch touch themselves and so if you're if you're having difficulty with that maybe try try like the shower head or or like I said like with a vibrator it might like maybe that would be an easier way if you feel uncomfortable touching yourself you know just like what what could make you feel safe to start trying and right. being a little bit brave of expanding yourself having a washcloth maybe or yes, yes exactly yeah that's great yes yeah, so, so then you can start kind of being curious about how your genitals respond to this not only your touch but your invitation of arousal energy without shame yeah without shame <laughs> yeah and I tell women like lots of times because if I've talked to women about doing this sometimes I see on their face like this is this isn't okay to do I shouldn't be doing this you know and I just say how do you just picture like I say picture yourself closing like a hundred doors on that voice that tells you that this is not okay because I'm telling you that this is this is okay and it is it's a beautiful experience for you to be able to see like what your body can offer you and so it, you do it's like takes conscious effort a lot of times to just say I'm just going to be present I'm just going to feel this and I'm not going to I'm not going to feel bad about this yeah and I'm going to be brave like there's a certain level of courage here right that you're describing like I'm going to this is going to take courage mm-hmm. for me to face something that feels somewhat maybe uncomfortable to me. Yeah. And what what have we been taught about discomfort, right? Oh, discomfort comes from Satan. I'm right? like, no, yeah. discomfort comes from all kinds of places, you know, yeah. and and usually facing some new growth or progress in ourselves is uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, a lot of times people are worried about like, oh, if this is a secret to my spouse or whatever, I say, I would, I would be tra- really transparent. I, I like always lean towards transparency on this kind of stuff. If you feel like you want to say, Hey, you know, partner, I'm going to be, I'm going to be trying to explore my body in a way that's different than what we've done together. And I'm going to be doing it by myself. Is that okay? You know? <laughs> and I think most people are, oh, are open to that again, like the sexual maturity where you feel like you have authority over your sex life, I think is really important for Mormons to feel like, yeah, we get to navigate how to, how to do this and how to, how to go forward with our sex life here. And most of the time your partner's probably going to be really excited about thinking about you doing that. I, I, most of the, at least husbands, when I've kind of talked about this with couples, they're like, that would be so cool if she did that, you know? And so I, oftentimes I say when, in regards to, in regards to masturbation in a married couple, I say, if it's taking away sexual energy from your marriage, then you guys need to then, then talk about that. Right. Cause that's, I wouldn't want to have, the the sexual connection that comes with being with a person and experiencing that vulnerability and that sacred space with that person to be um, compromised by just having a vibrator be the, you know, the only thing that you can do to have your orgasm, you know, and if it's the only way that you orgasm, that's fine too. But at least I want, I still want there to be that connection together. So I say very much be transparent, talk about if when it's okay and, what what the rules and boundaries are within your marital relationship about doing that. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. I think that's great. So yeah, just in relaxation and mindfulness and breathing and being kind of very patient and loving with yourself. Cause mm-hmm. what I find too is, is that women will lie there and, and they're like, Oh my gosh, there I go. I'm getting anxious. And they, the therapist told me not to get anxious and I can't believe I'm getting anxious. And what's wrong with me that I can't deal with this anxiety. <laughs> and, so, and so sadly it just kind of builds upon itself versus just being like, well, that's interesting that I'm anxious right now, you know, and that's, that's kind of, it's disappointing. Right. Maybe, and then, but it's right. And this huge drama that it's showing up. Right. And not always feeling like, even if you're just exploring your body, that it means that you have to get to orgasm either. Right. You know? And so that it's just like, yeah, if, if you don't orgasm, that's, that's fine too. But just kind of being able to say, I want to get connected with knowing what my body feels like when it's aroused. Just even just that alone, step one, because I do, I have so many people have so much pressure on the fact that they're not orgasming. Right. Right. And so then tasks like this just make it, it make them feel more disappointed and more frustrated. Right. Like a lot of what we're talking about today is 
is kind of, um, you can totally try and have fun with, but at the same time, it doesn't mean you're a failure or oh. that there's only one way to do it. And there's a lot of pleasure that can be had in, in shared sexuality, whether or not one or both partners reaches orgasm. Mm -hmm. And so just redefining sexuality. But again, I've, I've talked about that on other podcasts. What I, I think that sometimes people do want kind of the how to's. And so, yeah. you know, I think this is a good place to start. And, and you've mentioned vibrators can be a great tool. Communication with your spouse can be a great tool. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about guiding your partner's hand? That can often seem awkward to people or, again, the egos involved, right? Like if I tell him how to touch me or if I show him how to touch me, I'm going to hurt his feelings or vice versa. Mm -hmm. right? That he's, he's worried he's right, going to hurt her I'm, feelings. Completely. And that's where I'm talking about sexual maturity. And, and, and we don't learn how to say, just because someone might tell you what they like or don't like, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It means that they are trying to, to get better at you guys doing this together. Right. So that kind of like, you know, differentiation is the therapy word for it. Right. <laughs> which, which is like, how do you have some strength in your own, own self to be able to respond and see and notice how your person is becoming aroused, you know, um, there's been, I know that there's been, you, you and, you know, Jennifer Finlayson and Fife have talked a lot about differentiation and kind of relational maturity, sexual maturity, that all of those things I think are really important. So having, having, um, openness to learn and curiosity, learning the art of curiosity when it comes to your person, I think is one of the best gifts that you can give each other, right? Ask questions see what feels good, try, try different things, then ask, how did that, did that work for you? Did that not work for you? Sometimes in um, non-sexual exchanges, like when you're outside of the bedroom, it might be also good to kind of talk about uh, how the sexual experience went from, you know, the night before, or like last week or whatever it is to say, what worked for you, what didn't work for you. Sometimes in the moment, if people I don't, they feel insecure, like oh, I'm doing it wrong and I'm just going to give up. Right. And so maybe you can start with, if, if it, you can start with not doing it in the bedroom, sometimes that's been helpful for people. And then, and then because once they get more comfortable talking about it and talking about sex together and talking about what pleasures them and what works and things like that, then, then it can slowly be more comfortable in the bedroom and in the moment feedback. All right, so back to your multiple orgasm okay. technique. <laughs> Sorry, I should have started. We we kind of I just jumped right in. Like it was like a a four hundred level class versus the one hundred and one. You no, know? I, it's great. I I think this is this is really great because I do think that a lot of women experience kind of the refractory period that you're talking about. You know, like after an orgasm, you kind of go into this refractory period and you're right that men tend to go down quicker than women mm -hmm. um as far as the arousal state that stays present and so what you're saying is that you can um take advantage of that arousal state staying present by exploring possibly more orgasmic potential and that can be i've seen women that that's very much they're willing to do that i've seen other women where they feel like Oh my goodness, I that was so strong and so ridiculously good that I can't even bring myself to have energy to try again. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh yeah. And they're just like I'm 100% satisfied with my one big orgasm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So again, there's no one right way or wrong way, right? Like it's like can... like like I said, it's like ice cream flavors. There's so many ways to have an orgasm, you know? So yeah. I just always I just always like to talk and to women about how does it work for you? And here's some other tricks I've learned. If you're, if you're really comfortable with like doing that, then try some other things too. That's all I'm saying is that it's, it's surprising sometimes what, what can happen. Sure. Do you want to talk about, do you have other techniques you want yeah. to share? Or, do, yeah. 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 Let's okay. do it. <laughs> okay. So um, edging or withholding is the, uh, the other big one that I hear a lot from women. And it's kind of described as uh, where you get, once you really know your body well and your partner knows your body well, um, being able to kind of get to the, the your almost skin orgasm, like if if you know that 
you know, 100% is where you're going to orgasm, then stop at like 90%. So you, so you, you completely disengage, you, you, you just, you know, settle down for a second, do get distracted, do other things, you know, don't get yourself to the point of orgasm. Okay. And then, and then come back to it and, but then stop again. So it's, it's like this roller coaster ride. Okay. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. No, wait, get distracted. And then I'm going to come back and then I'm going to take go away again. And and then usually by maybe like the third time, then you, then you let yourself orgasm. And a lot of women have talked about that. It's like a super orgasm. Right. So that's like called, the, the extreme, the, the sensation is more extreme than it would have been. Yeah. It, it, it's like, it's a bigger, more like whole body feeling orgasm than just if you would have let yourself orgasm that first time. Right. Okay. So it's like a big reward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of, you know, and some people like some women often talk about, Oh, I tried to do that, but then I, then I lost my orgasm and it was like, wah, wah, you know, and I think, you know, maybe a lot of women have experienced that where something happens and you change or people move bodies and you're like, oh, I was almost there and now I can't get it back, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you do have to be really in tune with your body to be able to make some of these techniques happen. And you have to be able to know like, oh, I'm almost there, but I'm not, I'm not going to let myself go. I'm not going to let myself totally release yet. And so the depth of the orgasm has been reported to be pretty amazing on that. So that's called edging or withholding, the edging technique or withholding technique. Yeah, that's, and that applies to men as well. So that's something that, that men also will report having a stronger orgasms if they if they do that. Yeah. And that's also another way to help with premature ejaculation for men. So yeah, edgy or withholding, that's a, a super fun one to try. So it's kind of like you almost get there, you slow down, almost get there, slow down. And then at some point, let yourself just fill it. That's a good technique. Awesome. Okay. Um, I also really want to promote, um, there is a wonderful website called OMG Yes. It's basically um, a girl got an idea that you know, she was tar- started talking to her friends. And basically what we're talking about is just the idea of getting techniques and how to do it. And a lot of people say, oh, the elusive female orgasm, you know, every woman's different. There's not like uh, researched ways that help women orgasm. And so they did this study with the Kinsey Institute and Indiana University. So they took 2000 women from the age of 18 to 35 and they had asked really specific questions on technique and real detailed conversations. So they created this website where they, they were able to find that there are consistent ways that women liked to orgasm. And so they kind of share those ideas. It costs $30 right now to access the videos. And I think that they do a good job of walking the line of being education focused versus pornographic, but they do, they are really talking specifically about, you know, all the things. And so they, they do show women touching their vaginas and they show the vagina. So if you're going to click on it and buy that videos, know that you will be seeing that. And I, I think personally it's done really well. I think that they are really with the intention of trying to get women to enjoy orgasm better. So they go into tons of techniques. There's probably 10 with videos that show women how to do it. And they've created this technology where if you have like an iPad where you can learn exactly the technique that they're teaching, there's kind of like a a video of a vagina, the vulva, the outside of it. And you can like learn how to do the technique, the consistency or the rhythm that they're talking about. You can actually move it. So it's, it's really educational and the technology is pretty amazing. So that's awesome. I let's talk about this for a little bit because I think that educational videos can be quite a useful tool. Oh. And and yet oftentimes people just see that as well that's pornographic. These are usually videos that are done in very ethical atmospheres. People are very consensually being part of them. Many of these women who are in these videos just feel like they were so helped by some of these researchers or whatever studies they were part of that they want to give back. Mm -hmm. So it comes from a really empowering position. It's not people who are being taken advantage of or 
um, marginalized or you know, objectified or exploited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, it, again, back to your sexual maturity point, you know, what level uh, can we access information in a way that we're not discounting this entire resource? Completely. And, and it really is the women are, you know, all different shapes and sizes and all ages and all races. And it, I really feel like it's a website for women to be able to be like all the conversations that sometimes people are like, la la la, don't want to hear about this, you know, but it, they, but people do have questions. Like I have people all the time asking me, how do I orgasm or how do I enjoy sex more? You know, that's like, the big thing. And this, this website is very, very, um, graphically appealing. I'm a little kind of a graphic design brat. So graphically they've done a really nice job with making the, the content easy to understand. And it's just, it's just, it's a really beautiful website. They've they've done a great job. So when I was like preparing for this website, um, my husband had fallen asleep in my room with my boys, you know, he was putting the kids to sleep and I was like watching these videos and I was like, huh, you know, like they gave me like tons of good ideas. And I was like, I like woke him up and I was like, Scott, um, we, I've been doing research for my podcast. So you, you need to wake up cause we're going to have sex now. He's <laughs> I like, love it. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Wait, what? Okay. <laughs> you know? So it was totally funny. So it's like, it, it does like knowledge is power and knowledge is, it, it helps you be wanting to be more engaged in this beautiful thing that you get to do in a relationship, right? Absolutely. This is the, it's the difference between being roommates and coexisting as a couple and being lovers. And so it's super important to be invested in this. So women, for women to enjoy it and to learn and to just be open and to not feel shame and to celebrate their beautiful vaginas and all the parts, like to me, I'm just like this, it's the best when I see people being able to do, have this. Absolutely. So, Shout out to that website. It's called OMG Yes. And I will link to that. When I purchased it, you you just basically purchase access, a one-time access. And it was $30 when I purchased it. But it says like regularly $60, but I'm sure that, who knows? It's a great deal. To me, I just think for 30 bucks to get lots of these tips about how to maybe potentially make your orgasm better or or just to be able to listen to other women talk about it. It's really cool. So check it out. <laughs> I will. And I'll encourage everybody else to as well. Them. I know I've, I've, I've accessed other educational videos, not necessarily through that website. And it's just incredibly helpful in normalizing. You know, obviously, as sex therapists, we're not entering the bedroom with you. We're not giving you hands-on <laughs> oh. uh, direction. <laughs> so that's not part of our job description. And so, but oftentimes it can be, confusing or like I'm saying abstract you know but what do you exactly mean or how does that exactly work and there can be a lot of confusion around that and, and that's where I think some of these sexual videos can be very very helpful yeah yep and there's it's it's not like in any of the videos it's not people having sex it's good to know a full full knowledge of what you're getting into when you click on something so um, another great resource uh, the youtuber Lacey Green You've probably heard of her, Natasha, right? I love Lacey Green. Love Lacey Green. She's got tons of, um, so I think hers is called Sex Plus, Sex Positive. I don't know how she says it. but Yeah, I think it's Sex Plus. Yeah. On YouTube. On YouTube. She's a great one. Also, you know she has Mormon roots. Yes, I did know that. You got to get her on your podcast. I mean, I'm so curious about, like, I want all the details. It it would be awesome. Tell me all the Mormon details, Lacey Green, you know. (laughs) So um, she's got tons of just good information on all kinds of things in the bedroom. She just make, pumps out all these videos, and she's super fun and approachable. And she's very direct, and she's, she's very to the point, and she uses all the language, and, and it's a great way to get access to that information. I think some people might feel uncomfortable with how open she is, but what I usually like to tell people is that that's, in a sense, how she's talking is how our our kids are being talked to about sex by their friends and peers and things, but she's doing it correctly. We have to be open about these concepts and direct instead of, again, going back to kind of the, it's sacred, it's wonderful. It's these very general abstract words when people want information. Yeah. And and then what that what happens with that, in my opinion, is that that sets people up to be disappointed, you know, with their sex when and not to say, of course, I still think, yes, I'm a hundred percent believer that sex is sacred, that I feel like 
I'm like, my dad said that I'm exchanging souls with someone that I have sex with. Like I still am very much like, that's my worldview about sex. I think it's important. I think I want to take it seriously. And I think the not having real direct, accurate knowledge about what I'm getting into is super important, you know? So, and we don't do this about any other anatomy stuff, right? So if I've got a heart problem, uh, which I think is my heart is sacred, and I think that my body is a gift from God. I'm getting very specific, knowledgeable information about, you know, that whatever c- the cardiologist feels like I need to know about it. Mm-hmm. And it, and there's nothing shameful about that, right? And so mm-hmm. it, it kind of helps to have a more clinical approach to sexuality too. These are bodies. These are hormones. These are physical things, and we need to know how they work and how they function. And this is what's going to happen when you do these types of things to them. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the last, the last person I want to promote just because I think that they have good information. Her name is Sexplations and she, her Dr. Doe is what she goes by D O E. And she's fantastic too. She's a YouTuber. So those, those three websites I think are great resources. If you're wanting to get more, obviously the OMG, yes, that one is like you pay for content, but it's, amazing content it's worth the money if you are interested in learning more and really exploring more about this and then the other the two youtubers that Lacey green and then the sexplations both of them just have you know quick four to five minute videos on any topic you can think of related to sexuality and of course tons on female orgasm great yes g-spot okay (laughs) All right. So uh, so it's always like that. Does the G spot really exist? Right. And for, and for some women it does. And, and for some women it doesn't work. It's just, this is the same thing, but what, what it is, is it's about two inches inside your, uh, in your vagina. So, and it's on the the belly side. Okay. So a lot of people are like, where, which side is it on? The, The one closest to the belly is where you would be able to access your G spot and why the G spot, um, works is that the the organ of the clitoris comes down and it it kind of wraps close to where the urethra is and there's some glands there that produce it's kind of like the same content of sperm but without the not sperm with the male ejaculation without the sperm that's what i'm trying to say so when when that area is aroused it's kind of like where a lot of the parts come together and so when that is um aroused and stimulated and rubbed or licked or whatever it whatever you can do there that often can produce a really great orgasm too and why some women like being penetrated from behind because then the penis kind of hits that spot more yep. directly yep and mix that with some clitoral stimulation that can feel really good yeah Yep. And so the G spot, it, it, it exists. It's a thing for people. So, so yeah. yeah. And that's another thing to kind of like play around with, like, does it work for you? Is that, is that an area that's super sensitive and enjoyable and that helps you feel pleasure and could potentially get you to orgasm? It's good for you to kind of fill your body out that way and see if that works. And, and just like the clitoris, sometimes it needs to have consistent rubbing. It's not just like one touch and it's like, Whoa, my G spot. And now I'm like, you know, mind blown. It's like, you know, you get, you got to give a little effort. You got to give some consistency, some rhythm right in that spot, you know, to make it really work for you. Right. Yeah. Great. Love okay. the G spot. Love G- the clitoris. Mm-hmm. Love the vulva. Vulva squirting is another one that comes up a lot for people to want to talk about. So yes. maybe we'll quickly talk about the squirting. So again, sometimes it works for girls. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, About 60% of women report to maybe unexpectedly having it sometime in their life. And so it happens, you know, and so what, what's happening is that that gland that's right by the urethra, it it kind of can fill, fill up with the the fluid. It sometimes feels like you're peeing when it happens, Um, but it is actually coming out your urethra hole. And sometimes for some women, it kind of shoots out that looks similar to like a male ejaculation. And it's not urine. It's not urine. Nope. It's not urine. And so if you're somebody that, that tends to like squirt a lot or that it, that is something that you can do sometimes like laying down blankets or towels so that, you know, it, 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 there, there's more, there's more liquid than just when you have an orgasm another way that's just like 
you know, lubrication and things like that. So sometimes some women feel kind of shamed or embarrassed, or they might feel embarrassed to their partner that their partner might be embarrassed. But I just say, well, that's just one way that your body works. There's no reason to be embarrassed about it. And sex so, yeah. is generally kind of a messy thing when it comes to our hygienized <laughs> culture, right? <laughs> Germ-free oh, like, and antibacterial like, soap. And <laughs> it's like one of the biggest things that I tell tell girls like that are maybe engaged to be married and have never had sex. I'm like, you need to know, like, sex is messy. There's a smell to it. Like, girls, like, if you have sex with a man and he comes inside you, it's going to come out the next day. Those things are what's not talked about, right? Is that, like, all of these things that come with sex that feel embarrassing or that feel kind of, like, weird or strange or is everybody else having this thing? It's like, yes, everybody everybody is is engaging in this and being able to talk openly about it and be okay with it and not feel shame that it happens differently than you or you know, different for different people, you know, the way that you like it might be different than the way other women like it. And th- that's okay. That's, it's all okay. But it's so, it's so important to figure out like how your body can work and how you can feel how it can connect you to a person that you get to do it with. Cause it is the ultimate vulnerability to be able to experience that with someone. I really encourage people to do a lot of reframing around the bodily fluids, you know, the odor and uh, wetness can really be a turn on if you allow that potential to be there because it is that it's the clues it's the bodily clues that we give to one another that there is arousal that there is um excitement going on that there's something sensual and sexual happening so there's potential there to kind of start shifting your mind about some of those things there's also things that will help if you don't want to reframe so there's oils or aromas or things that can help you know if you really find that those things kind of get in the way of your sensuality but I think there's something really beautiful about just um taking ourselves as we come yeah literally (laughs) (laughs) so the other thing that I I when people are kind of trying to open themselves up to this a little bit more it doesn't hurt to go into like a shop like a local shop like up here in Washington it's called like lover's package or I know in Salt Lake, it's like the blue boutique or whatever, just some sort of one of the sex shops and, and just like walking through and like seeing all the things. It's a really fun educational experience. Like you were talking about the oils, like there's actually a whole section of oils or whatever that you can, you can put on your body so that it can, it can be flavorful or, you know, if if that's like an issue for, if, if the odor or smell is an issue for you. So there's, there's so many things like this is a big business for people to help sex be better, you know, and just going in and seeing, seeing all the vibrators, seeing all of, all of the toys that you could potentially use. There's so many wonderful toys that you can do as for couples. You know, like I remember one of my girlfriends who I love dearly for my, for my wedding gift, she gave me like a partner sex toy. It's called the double trouble. And it was such an easy way to introduce us as a, as a couple to be able to be like, yeah, like we sometimes have sex toys. Do we use them all the time? No, but like sometimes it's, it is, it is super fun. So just being open to saying, is that, is that something that would feel comfortable for us to have incorporated in our sex life? And there's, there's just a lot of really amazing things that they've figured out with, with, with in regards to toys and just any other sexual accessory. There's so much out there. Right. So just right. going in and like asking questions, oftentimes they have classes that, that you can like learn all the things. And so that that's another way to be able to kind of see if there's something out there that might feel comfortable for you or might be appealing for you as like one of your, on, on the sexual buffet of delights that you can participate in. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Sexual buffet of delights. <laughs> Lovely. Well, and, and there's something to be said. As therapists, we know that for some anxieties and phobias, exposure therapy can be helpful, you know, just to kind of get yourself um, more and more exposed to whatever it is that you're anxious about. And granted, most of that work is done around spiders or germs or <laughs> things of that nature. But but I think there's something that, that applies to sexuality as well. You know, the more that you're willing to kind of get out of your comfort zone, the more that you're willing to do things like step into a sex uh, toy store or go to a sex toy class or mm-hmm. visit a certain website that we're referring you to, Mm-hmm. It, it becomes easier. You're not usually going to have the same amount of anxiety or discomfort as mm-hmm. you become more 
comfortable with with some of these concepts. It's not as scary as you might think it's going to be, right? Yeah. It feels really scary to some people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I haven't ever seen any, like, if we're talking in regards to, like, Mormon stuff, I've like, I haven't seen anything that tells you after you get married, here's the do's and don'ts around sexuality. No, there's a great quote in the Bishop's Handbook that says it's really kind of up to the couple to negotiate. Um, I don't have it memorized or anything, but it's about a paragraph long. And granted, in there, there's those words like, you know, don't do anything coercive or abusive, which I think is great. It also says don't do anything unholy. And I think that's where people get kind of caught up. Like, what does unholy mean to you versus what unholy means to me? But going back to, I think, what you said earlier, which is this concept of, is this something that's going to you know, draws closer together? Is this something that's going to elicit more pleasure for us as a couple and join us and bring passion and all this stuff that we're, we're excited to explore. And, and, and that can be really the way that you negotiate so much of this from mm -hmm. a believing stance. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Well, we've been at it for a while mm -hmm. and <laughs> I would love to give you an opportunity to share any closing thoughts or anything that you had hoped to share that I didn't open up the discussion to overall i just feel that the biggest block for people to really be able to experience this is a, a really around anxiety and it's a it will be a blessing to your life to be able to figure this out for yourself and i i wish many many women that are listening to this and men that are listening to this and partners that are wanting to engage this way with their partner in a bigger way to to really start communicating you know, get, get sexual maturity when it, like when you actually have to have hard conversations, you know, put on some thick skin and come to the conversation in a way that will really engage a positive sexual experience with each other. Cause it is a huge gift that we have. It's a blessing to marriages and it just makes for happier people. You are happy when you're having orgasms. <laughs> you're more confident when you can know your body, you feel better about your body. You feel more excited about who you are as a person. And so it's a real passion of mine. I feel really excited to be able to help people do this. I love my job. It's just such a cool job. So that is what I kind of got to say about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending yeah. your time with us today. This has just been really valuable. And I hope um, that regardless of where you are in your own orgasmic journey, that, that there were hopefully tidbits today that, that you can benefit from as far as listening. So thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. We took the long road home Turned minutes into miles And as the evening Traveled on, the sunset bathed your smile. We stopped beneath the desert stars, wrapped in each other's arms. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary. Extraordinary truth It's been a long road here A trail with tears Pain and sorrow too But through every storm we traveled on Like lovers do And if sometimes we fell apart We always came back home Was as simple as I love
Some people say, people say love is blind and forever is too long. But I see your eyes in every sunrise. Can't imagine life alone. Watch it by my side till the day I die. Then into the beyond. It's as simple as our love is. That's how I wanna go. All wrapped up in the arms. Extraordinary. It's nothing hard to marry love. Ordinary. Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary.